Hello and welcome to Farmland. Later on today's programme, I'll be speaking to a young dairy farmer from County Tipperary, Ronan O'Connor, who's a member of the Irish Creamery Milk Suppliers Association. He feels strongly that the voice of young farmers should be heard, especially as the new cap is implemented. But first, I'm joined in studio by General Secretary of the Irish Cattle and Sheep Farmers Association, Eddie Punch, and we're discussing the new Acres programme, the Agri-Environment Climate Programme, recently announced by Agriculture Minister Charlie McConnellogue. Thanks for joining us on Farmland today, Eddie. First of all, let's start talking about the um, Acres programme, which was recently announced by the Minister for Agriculture. This, I suppose, is viewed as the replacement to the GLOSS scheme. Now, ICSA has come out already um, with the sort of wary welcome, I'd say you could say, just saying that perhaps it lacks maybe a little innovation or perhaps doesn't, you know, incentivize farmers enough. Having read, I suppose, the details of the scheme now, what is the view of ICSA in relation to it? Yeah, Stella. Well, I, I think the first thing is that we've been listening now for several years to, I suppose, the European objectives for this cap reform. And the only phrase in town is the European Green Deal. Uh, we have EU farm to, farm to fork strategy. We have the EU biodiversity strategy. Everything is green. And this is controversial amongst farmers. Uh, it's not that farmers aren't green. Uh, farmers are actually at the forefront of biodiversity. They've done many, many things in improving the efficiency of their farm from an ecological point of view. So we would have expected that the common agricultural policy reform, if nothing else, would have delivered an environmental scheme that would put real money in the pockets of real farmers to trying to make a real difference. Uh, and, you know, farmers were very disappointed uh, at the time of the economic crash when the REPS uh, scheme was effectively shut down. And it was replaced with a really an austerity type agri-environment scheme called GLOSS. But that was put in place at a time where there was no money available and where there was a lot less, I suppose, emphasis and weight put on the, the environmental objectives. So what we've got now is a scheme that's somewhat better than GLOSS, yes, but considerably less valuable to farmers than the REP scheme of 20 years ago. And that's the fundamental problem. The second part of it, of course, is not only in terms of how much money does it put in farmers' pockets, how many farmers will benefit. And we see a target of 50,000 farmers. You know, 20 years ago, we had targets to have 60,000 farmers. And when the REP scheme was closed down, there were 62,000 participants in that scheme. So that doesn't speak to us as if the actions are in line with the words when it comes to the environment. Yes, you mentioned there the capacity for the scheme, 50,000, I think 30,000 in the what will be called acres general and another 20,000 in, in cooperation zones. Now, these cooperation zones are primarily along coastal areas, areas of high value in terms of biodiversity, environment and special areas and so on. And indeed, probably a lot of your members are, are in this area. 20,000, is that enough? What about farmers who will have to end up competing, I suppose, for, for eligibility for this? Will there um, be enough capacity to cater for all of the farmers that maybe want to improve their environmental um, methodology? Well, well, yeah, you're, you're right, Stella. As you've said, there's 20,000 for the, the enhanced scheme, which pays you know potentially over 10,000 euros at a maximum. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of, I, I think, hope and it really is, you know, live horse and you'll get grass here, that this can be made to work. This is a complete experiment. It's expecting that we can get all of these farmers into a program where they cooperate with each other. There's a lot of money going to be spent on consultants to make this all happen. And we met the department about this about a year ago, and, and I have to say that at that time, there was very much a sense that this was at the drawing board. But one year on, I'm not sure that we have any more clarity that the department really knows whether this will work or not. It is an experiment and it is bound to be challenging. Not so much 
to get, you know, it's not so much the question is 20,000 enough for this scheme, it is how are we going to actually make it work? And of course, it brings us to the other point, which is that uh, the vast majority of farmers are not eligible for this scheme. There are many counties where there is no part of the county eligible. And a lot of counties, even where there are locations, you can think about Clare, Kerry, all of these, a lot of the county still isn't eligible. So the majority of farmers, the vast majority of farmers, a lot of them are commercial beef, suckler and sheep farmers, are, are basically chasing the, I suppose, basic uh, acre scheme, but there's only 30,000 places. And we're very concerned in ICSA that that means a lot of farmers won't get into this scheme. And even if you do, the maximum payment is, is just over 7,000 euros. Now we all know, and you know, everybody out there is well aware that 7,000 euros in the current environment is very small money when you look at the way costs have gone on farming. Uh, you know, we, we all know that diesel is double what it was 18 months ago. And, you know, a lot of the work that is required to be done for these kind of agri-environment schemes involves essentially labour costs and, and all of the other costs as well. So we think the money is, is looking very, uh, very weak and yet there isn't enough places in the scheme. Yeah, that I suppose is a dilemma in the sense that, yes, there may not be enough places in the scheme. However, on the other side of the coin, you have to try and encourage farmers to participate or at least apply for the scheme and if it doesn't incentivize them enough will they do so it's a very good question and you know there's another point here in the economy which is that there are any amount of jobs out there and farmers are skilled people uh, particularly younger farmers uh, many of them have other qualifications and many of them are working in, in everything from building, construction, transport, haulage, agricultural contracting. And people really have to look now in terms of the value of their time. For a long number of years, we in ICSA have been critical about, you know, for example, Chagas metrics in terms of a profit monitor have always been focused on the hectare. But the real question is, how much do you get for an hour of your valuable time? And in a world where, you know, outside of dairying, in the cattle and sheep sectors in particular, a lot of farmers are looking at off-farm uh, income opportunities. Schemes such as an agri-environment scheme have to compete in terms of what return you get for how many hours you put in compared to what you can get elsewhere. And at the end of the day, every farmer their first responsibility is to put bread on the table for themselves and for their families. And, you know, we can talk all we want about environmental sustainability. And we in ICSA are, you know, big fans of, of trying to, you know, enhance the landscape. And farmers have done so much. I was in Connemara only a couple of weeks ago. And when you look at the way that landscape has been maintained, that is first and foremost a tribute to the farm families in Connemara. But that said, farmers have to make a living the same as everybody else and in a high cost environment like we're, we're in at the moment, I have a big concern that the common agricultural policy reform in its totality has lost sight of the fact that a euro today is not the same as a euro two years ago. That's true and the European Commission is still, I suppose, part of that process where they're reviewing the strategic plan for Ireland. Um, it is what it is now in, in terms of what the, the department and the minister has, has lobbied for for this country, for us as a member state. And whether or not the commission will come back and approve our strategic plan, we have to wait, we hope, in, in the coming uh, weeks and months that we will find that out. But I suppose the key element coming from Europe is that everybody will have to work towards environmental standards up to 2030 and subsequently on to 2050. And I suppose livestock is being hit particularly as a sector in the sense we're waiting for the sectoral carbon ceilings for each sector in Ireland to be announced shortly. Can farmers or will farmers be able to sustain the additional costs without more support either from Europe or from, from the Irish government? Acres has come out now, but you're sort of indicating even at this, it's not enough. Yeah, and, and I think you know, 
you're absolutely right. There's a real, real problem now about the amount of funding for the common agricultural policy. It's all very well saying, you know, we got a better deal than we might have done. But the reality is that for many years, we have seen the value of the CAP eroded in terms of its percentage of the EU budget and in absolute terms. And at the same time as all of this has been going on, the European Central Bank has been printing money in response to first the financial crisis and then even more, more spectacularly in relation to the COVID crisis. And that is now coming home to roost in terms of inflation. There, there is no two ways of avoiding that fact. And in a world where lots of extra money has been printed, the common agricultural policy has completely fallen behind in terms of being able to deliver what it was originally set out to do, let alone all of the extra objectives. And, you know, you can't have more and more objectives asking farmers to do more and more for less and less in real terms, in, in economics, in real economic terms. But that's what's happening. So, you know, we think it's time for politicians, both at, at national level and right across Europe, to face up to the fact that we have to get balance. And if one thing has happened from the invasion of Ukraine, it is that we need to start looking at the right balance between vibrant rural communities, food security, energy security, and other environmental goals. And for the last couple of years, we have a real sense that in Brussels, there is a detachment for what's going on, from what's going on on the ground with ordinary people, whereby Brussels has, you know, become obsessed, if you like, led by Vice President Timmermans, it has to be said, who, who's driving the agenda for targets about we're going to have 30% of our land designated. We're going to have 10% designated as specially protected areas. No question about the cost to farmers of this. We're going to have, you know, 25% of our land uh, organically farmed. No question about, well, are the consumers going to pay enough of a, a premium for this? We have uh, a common agricultural policy where farmers are expected to produce high quality nutritious food to ever increasing animal welfare standards, uh, ever increasing water quality standards, ever increasing air standards and saving the planet as well. And we're expected to do all of this at a time where inflation is driving the cost of everything through the roof. There's a reality check needed here. And from our point of view in ICSA, you look at things like in the comments, uh, the, the strategic plan for CAP, we have, in theory, a higher payment in the suckler cow scheme. But that's replacing two schemes, the BDGP and the BEEP. So in fact, it's a lower scheme. So we in ICSA want to see a separate scheme delivered in this year's budget, uh, paid for out of you know, the national coffers. Otherwise, we are, we are really sending a signal to farmers uh, you're not wanted. And that's, you know, I, I think politicians have to say where they stand on this, because at the end of the day, we won't deliver any targets on climate change or on biodiversity if farmers can't make a living. And if they can't make a living, they'll go elsewhere. And they, look, there's any amount of jobs in construction as, as a simple example. So I, I think, you know, yes, there is, there is absolutely a question of funding. And, you know, even though prices, thankfully, have been a bit, a bit better, the economics of dairying are still solid. The economics of beef finishing at five euros a kilo are off the charts. I mean, from our point of view, it looks more like winter finishing needs a price of closer to 7.50 a kilo. Will that be delivered? Time will tell. But, you know, we have to have the supports in place as well if we want rural Ireland to have cattle farming, sheep farming and environmentally friendly farming. And where can that support come from now? You mentioned national funding there for some sort of uh, scheme in the budget for sucklers. But at the end of the day, the cap has been agreed now. And you mentioned earlier, I think that the phrase that came out of it was we got more than we thought we could have. But in light of the rapid way that things are changing now, um, particularly obviously, well, it started with Brexit, but obviously with food security now and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, things have, have deteriorated in terms of, of being able to have that food security and feed a growing population in the world. 
does emergency measures at this stage almost new, need to be considered by, by various governments? Yeah, I mean, governments certainly. And, and some of the member states now are coming up with, with funds which are being, I suppose, sanctioned by Brussels because it all has to go through the, the state aid process. And Brussels has become more, I suppose, willing to look. And, and we've seen, you know, schemes for Italy, Romania, etc. Lot, lots of different countries have got it. So we've got to come to the table now as well and deliver money and, and get approval from Brussels. But I don't think Brussels can be let off the hook either and, and, and allow it just to be about member states. We have a, an NGEU, Next Generation EU fund, which is worth 750 billion. And farming, I think, is going to have to get a bigger share of that. Not necessarily farming for uh, production, although that's important, but all of these extra objectives to deal with uh, you know, the, the inflationary crisis, the energy security issue, the food security issue. Uh, we need to look at a bigger share of that. And I think our, our, our leaders in, in, in all of the member states, including our own, and our members of European Parliament have got to say, actually farming needs a bigger chunk out of this than, than the small amount that has been delivered. There's a lot of concern just with the acute kind of pullback, we'll say, on land price, for example, over the last uh, couple of weeks. And as you said, there's no guarantee with beef price at the end of the year. They won't know until the end of the year what prices are at. Um, is there concern within ICSA at the moment in relation to the pullback in land price? Um, of course, there's always a risk. There were scares over the last couple of weeks as well in relation to foot and mouth. Should we be importing as much? Should we be getting better prices here? What's your feeling on that? Yeah, look, at our, our chief chairman, John McNamara, has been very adamant that the 70 cent type of reduction that's that's been attempted cannot be allowed to go ahead. It is unconscionable to bring in those kind of huge drops in sheep price at a time when costs are through the roof. And I, I think, look, there has to be a message put out as well to retailers and to customers for our meats all over Europe that in the current inflationary crisis, the prices the farmers get are going to have to be substantially higher. There's no point in beating around the bush. And I think if meat factories want to go back to the old games of, of you know, cutting whenever they can, they can finish the cattle themselves in their own feedlots because I don't see too many farmers who are going to risk finishing cattle in a high expense system like winter finishing with meal potentially at 500, maybe even higher per ton. Um, so it's really time now for you know, a different kind of conversation where uh, the meat industry and the retail sector are going to have to face that the inflation that is to be seen in other consumer products, we can't have a lack of reality about food price as well. Eddie, thank you very much for joining us on Farmland today. Thank you, Stella. Rowan, thanks for joining us today. You're a member of the Irish Creamery Milk Suppliers Association and indeed a, a young farmer yourself in Tipperary. First of all, tell me about your role within the ICMSA. Thanks, Stella. Thanks for having me on. Um, I suppose my role within the ICMSA is um, an area development officer. I cover the east and the southeast of the country to deal with farmers' issues on a daily basis and to help chairmen in their roles. I also recruit new members and work with young farmers. So mentioning young farmers there, you're a young farmer yourself. We're, we're here today to talk, I suppose, about young farmers specifically. Can you tell me what are the challenges primarily they're facing at the moment, Ronan? I suppose young farmers, to incentivize young farmers into the industry is going to be a big challenge into, into the future. But some of the challenges they're facing at the moment is um, I suppose around you know labour. If if it may, most young farmers would have got in, in in a big way into into the dairy industry and you know cut, cuts around I suppose methane and 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 you know carbon they won't help far young farmers going into the future because I suppose they've invested heavily into the industry. So that's number one I suppose. Going on from that I suppose young farmers are you know th there's a bit of isolation around the industry and um, you know things like that. And you mentioned there, I suppose, the methane emissions. There is a lot coming in from Europe in terms of our climate targets and what we have agreed to for 2030 and 2050. 
the CAP strategic plan, I suppose, is just being finalised at the moment for Ireland and what that will entail. Recently, there has been an agri-environment scheme announced. Do you think that some of the requirements that are coming in in environmental terms are deterring young entrants or young new entrants into the sector? Well, they're not incentivising them, I'll put it that way. Um, I would say the new entrants that we've in for now are at a limit, you know, um, the, the industry really, you know, it can't take many, much more, you know, new entrants into the industry. Um, there, there is a policy there by all co-ops that they have to take shareholders um, on as, as, a, as an entrant. But I suppose they, they will be, you know, they will be um, <laughs> shareholders, so they, but technically speaking, wouldn't be a new entrant. But um, yeah, look, I think we're at a limit now, and I think that you know what's there, what what new entrants are there are there. Have you concerns about this new cap coming in in terms of some of the limitations it might put on young farmers, or some of the challenges that young farmers will face specifically in relation to the cap? I do indeed. I th I think that it, it's, some of the things on it are are very disincentivizing towards to towards farming as a, as a whole and young farmers. And I think that, you know, we need to be very careful on how we work with young farmers and, and, and keep them, I suppose, um, you know, interested in the, in the industry. Because at the end of the day, it is families and we want to see family farms in rural Ireland going into the future. Let's look at something like the nitrates derogation then and, and the impact of that and I suppose future incomes for farmers. Nitrates derogation obviously affects all farmers, but for new farmers or for younger farmers it's going to heavily impact them going forward for the future isn't that the case well look i suppose at 106 you know that that has a serious impact and you know let's be real a lot of younger farmers would have expanded would have ha would have went in at a bit higher you know output a higher number of cows and I suppose at that rate, like, you know, you, it will be serious cuts back and they will have to come back from whatever high number they were at. So, you know, it is a, it, it doesn't look good. It doesn't in that sense. What would you suggest then? Will there have to be supports put in for those type of farmers? Well, I suspect that, you know, there'll have to be, I suppose, you know, the, the cuts are going to come and they're going to, you know, the cows are going to have to come back. But there should be, you know, there, there's going to have to be more grant aid in place to replace the, the cost, I suppose. Ronan, in terms of, I suppose, the future and what we will have to do in terms of meeting environmental measures, do you think young farmers, I suppose, are more primed, perhaps, to adapt new innovations, agri-tech, new technologies that will help them meet those climate charges, uh, changes in terms, I suppose, do you think that the, the young farmers are constantly educating themselves now and maybe teaching if they're trying to take over a farm enterprise from parents and so on, maybe teaching them about new ways of doing things that might benefit them? Look, there's no doubt about it, Stella. Young farmers are, um, they are the top of their field when it comes to new technologies and new infrastructures and, and you know, and that would all come from colleges within recent years. They are great to incentivize, you know, how to do modern day things like grass measuring, like, you know, breeding, everything. You know, they're all up to date on that, which is brilliant. And that will help, I suppose, in this whole environmental issue, you know, to get the best out of each cow that is possible and best out of each acre of land. What about the ICMSA then, for example? So in this country, we have uh, some young farmer organisations, but do you feel that perhaps there's an opportunity within your own, um, I suppose, organisation, farm organisation, to maybe represent young farmers on a, on a stronger platform, a more specific one? I suppose, look, that will move on to our young farmer group. I, I've, I've had a trial, the young farmer group was in Tipperary there nearly two years ago now. Um, COVID has held it up over a period of time, but I've trialled a group which is in South Tipperary and it's mid South West Tipperary area. That's the kind of the area this group would be in. Um, the group was started by me. I, I, I gathered a few together for the group and um, within the area, um, it's a raging success, may I say. Now we're on about six meeting now and a, and a farm tour in, in the middle of it. Um, to start with, I suppose, it, it was held in Seamus Tri's yard in Coldbrook Turles. Um, 
and th that was a, a brilliant success. We discussed farm policy, um, we, we, we had a chat about the importance of how farm organisations work for a younger level. We got their input um, and we, we led on from there. Where do you think this could go? Could this be expanded to other counties, given that you've got such strong feedback and, and it has been so successful trialling it in Tipperary? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Um, I'm, I'm working on Kilkenny and um, Offaly and North Tipperary at the moment. Um, there's great, um, I suppose, drive for it in those counties. Um, I would like to ex expand it to most counties in the country. But look, we we'll see how it gets on. It's getting on very well in Tipperary. I'm very happy with what's happening. Um, meetings are held m roughly monthly to month and a half. Um, it, it basically just update lads on policy, discuss, I suppose, we discussed earlier on, you know, that it, there, I, well, I mentioned earlier on that there was, a, there was an issue around, I suppose, isolation on farms, especially for young farmers to meet up within their county, I suppose it, it's brilliant. What would you say is the biggest single concern for young farmers at the moment, including yourself or your, your friends or colleagues who you'd be speaking to on an ongoing basis? What's their biggest concern and what would your advice to them be? Well, the biggest concern, I suppose, at the moment, you know, would be that yeah, with all the, I suppose, doom and gloom factor around this whole climate, this climate, that, um, you know, are they going to be, is it going to be viable to go into the future? And my comments on that, of course it will be. It, it will die down and it will become, I suppose, very sustainable in the long run. I mean, you know, and, and there are my comments on that, that it will all die down, the hype will die down and we will be able to, maintain a solid future within the family farm. Well commodities are good at the moment, milk price is certainly not the worst it's ever been and uh, dairy is looking positive, demand for dairy is con continuing across the globe and I suppose a lot of farm organisations, a lot of farmers even who aren't in farm organisations would say food still has to be produced and particularly so on an increasing level now as our population grows. So. Do you think that that maybe is a bit of a beacon or a shining light to the industry? As you said, there's a lot of doom and gloom, but maybe still some young farmers might be smart enough to know, well, look, we still have to produce food. There will be a sustainable industry there at the end of the day. Well, look, around that, I suppose, you know, as you said, food has to be produced um, and, and, and we, we are great food producers in this country. And, you know, we, we, we produce a very high quality food here. And you see that with the Lambia cheese plant below in Bellevue being, you know, that cheese is, is, a, is a high quality cheese. And um, that, that, that should add to the market in some regard, whether, whether we be restricted or not, you know, or not. Which, um, and um, I suppose on that, we, we can, I suppose, work on it and, and, and excel on that. And, I, you know, what, what markets are there currently will, will help that. Finally, Ronan, what would you say to maybe government, Department of Agriculture, or even if they had to go back to Europe, from a young farmer standpoint, what would you really be pushing them on if you if you had the ear of, of the Minister for Agriculture there tomorrow morning? I would say just, you know, on a common sense point of view, make sure to, you know, keep incentivizing young farmers um, on and, and lead on and, and um, make sure to protect the family farm into the future. Those incentives, I suppose, would be policy driven then in terms of what, you know, farmers could get out of it if, if they do enter into it or continue on a farm enterprise from their parents. Well, look, to support young farmers is one thing, but, you know, to, to make sure incentivize them um, and pay them pro in, in the right manner, I suppose, and high MIG price and high grant aid on, on equipment around farms and make sure like to protect the likes of you know, a family farm in in this country to make sure that there is granted there for a milk and parlour and bull tank going in into the future. You know, they don't last for absolutely ever, um, and and that 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 is one thing that that we we hope that will stay in place. Ronan, thank you very much for joining us on Farmland. We'd be interested to hear and get updates from you in the future to see if the uh, young farmer grouping within ICMSA is expanded out to further for counties. And I'm, I'm sure it will be very popular over the coming months. So we'll stay in touch with that. Thanks for joining us, Ronan. Thank you. That's all from this episode of Farmland. Thanks for tuning in. You can stay up to date on all the latest agricultural news on agriland.ie or follow us at the following links.